Hi guys. To start off this video, I wanted to show off one of my favorite chemistry demonstrations, the lemon battery. So what we're going to do is actually measure the fact that there is a voltage associated with this little lemon construction that I've created here. So I've got a piece of copper metal stuck into one side of the lemon right here and a piece of zinc metal stuck into the other side and I've squeezed it a little bit to get some of that lemon juice out and flowing around the copper and zinc metal. And what I'm going to do is connect these voltmeter leads to the uh, copper and zinc and we're going to see what happens. And I've got it set to millivolts here for dramatic effect. So when I connect the leads here, what we can see is that there's actually a voltage generated. We can actually get this pretty high. I had it up at 900 millivolts earlier. Let's see if I can get it back up there. See, it's, it's topping out at about 7, 800. There we go. There we go. Now we're up at about 900. In this unit, we're going to talk about electrochemistry, and we're going to learn all about how and why this situation gives rise to a voltage. This is comparable to about two-thirds of a AAA battery, so a good amount of voltage out of this thing. We're going to understand where this comes from on a chemical level, what it is chemically about the copper and zinc that gives rise to an electrical potential difference. That has to do with redox chemistry, electron transfer, and more broadly the field of electrochemistry, which concerns extracting electrical energy from chemical energy or converting electrical energy into chemical energy going the other way. That's what this unit is all about. In this video series, we're going to talk all about electrochemistry, which concerns the interplay between electrical and chemical energy in redox or electron transfer reactions. And so we're going to start by reviewing redox reactions and redox chemistry, defining oxidation number, oxidation, and reduction. And then we're going to see how we can specially engineer a cell called a galvanic cell to take advantage of the energy built into a spontaneous redox reaction to produce a voltage. And a cell like this that uses a spontaneous redox reaction to produce an electrical potential difference and drive electric current is known as a galvanic cell. We'll then learn how to calculate the potential of a galvanic cell given the components of the cell and the concentrations of any aqueous species, any species in solution, in electrode and cell potentials. In the fourth section, we're going to relate cell potential to free energy and chemical equilibrium. And this makes an important point about this unit as a whole. Electrochemistry, as we'll discuss it here, is really an application of chemical equilibrium and chemical thermodynamics at its root. So we'll see equations, for example, that are going to be reminiscent of equations we've seen previously. For example, the Nernst equation is going to look a lot like a relation between free energy and the equilibrium constant that we've come across previously. From there, we're going to move into applications of electrochemistry, starting with batteries and fuel cells, and then talking about corrosion, and then finally electrolysis, which in a sense is the opposite of a galvanic cell. In an electrolysis process, we use an external circuit to send electrons into a chemical system and drive an otherwise non-spontaneous or unfavorable redox reaction. Let's start by reviewing redox chemistry and redox reactions. So a redox reaction, or the more long-winded term here is oxidation-reduction reaction, involves the transfer of one or more electrons from one species to another. And in thinking about transferring electrons, we can talk about a species that loses electrons, that's what we call oxidation, and a species that gains electrons, and that's what we call reduction. And at the bottom of this slide, we see an example of a redox reaction between metallic elemental sodium, Na solid, and chlorine gas, Cl2 gas. Two Na's react with the Cl2 to produce two NaCl solids, two sodium chlorides. Notice here that sodium metal becomes sodium cation. This is an oxidation process. Sodium starts out in the zero oxidation state. We'll talk about how to determine this on the next slide. And in NaCl, sodium is in the plus one oxidation state. And so the oxidation number has increased. This is oxidation. If we look at Cl2, on the other hand, 
Cl2, chlorine is in the zero oxidation state, and in NaCl, it goes to the negative one oxidation state. So its oxidation number has decreased or been reduced, therefore it is undergoing reduction. Now let's formalize these terms a little bit more by defining oxidation number or oxidation state. So oxidation number is a way of defining the charge on an atom similar in spirit to formal charge, but with a different strategy for thinking about how we distribute electrons to assign a charge. Oxidation number is specifically defined as the charge that an atom would possess if it were involved in only ionic bonds. So what we do with any covalent bonds is we give both electrons in the bond, say it's just a single bond, although this works for double and triple, we give all of the electrons in that bond to the more electronegative atom. That's why you're prompted here to consider electronegativity. The charges that result after we do that are the oxidation numbers. And on the rest of the slide here, you see some rules for assigning oxidation number that are gonna be very helpful for becoming more efficient so that you don't have to kind of mentally split bonds every time you see uh, a compound, right? Really quickly before we dig into the rules, if we go back to NaCl, in an ionic compound, all you need to do is split up the ionic compound into its component ions with their appropriate charges. And you can, if we're talking about monatomic cation, monatomic anion, you can easily infer what the oxidation numbers are. So for example, in NaCl, Na has a charge of plus one, that's an Na plus cation, that's why it's in the plus one oxidation state, and Cl has a charge of negative one, that's the chloride anion, and that's chlorine, in the oxidation state of negative one. So for monatomic ionic compounds or binary ionic compounds that don't involve polyatomic ions, this is pretty straightforward. Rule number one is also very straightforward. The oxidation number of an atom in its elemental form is zero. And this includes any monatomic metallic element and the diatomic elements like Br2, Cl2, I2, H2, those atoms are all in the zero oxidation state since electrons, if they're involved in a bond, are shared equally, right? Those covalent bonds in H2 and Cl2, for example, are nonpolar covalent bonds. As we just mentioned, if we're talking about a monatomic ion, Na+, Li+, Mg2+, Al3+, the oxidation number of a monatomic ion is simply equal to its charge. Rule number three lists some common oxidation numbers for, for common elements. Hydrogen, most commonly it's going to be linked to a non-metal in which, uh, most commonly, yeah, it's going to be linked to a non-metal in which case its oxidation number is plus one when the non-metal is more electronegative than hydrogen, which is typical. But when hydrogen is linked to a metallic element, well then hydrogen itself is more electronegative than the metal, and so its oxidation number is negative one. And again, you can infer this from the definition at the top of the slide. By taking the bond that hydrogen is involved in and giving those electrons to the more electronegative atom in the bond. Oxygen is typically more electronegative than whatever it's connected to, and so most typically it's in the oxidation number of negative two. There are very, very few exceptions to this. The halogens, well, if we're talking about fluorine, which is the most electronegative element on the periodic table, fluorine always is in the oxidation state of negative one for our purposes. And for the other halogens, these are negative one when they're linked to less electronegative atoms via single bonds, for instance, but when they show up in polyatomic anions, polyatomic oxyanions like perchlorate, hypochlorite, etc., they're going to have a positive oxidation number since they're linked to oxygen, which is more electronegative than those halogens below fluorine. And so they'll have some positive oxidation number value. It's actually not necessarily equal to the number of oxygens that the halogen is linked to. This is a little bit misleading on the slide, but you can work it out by applying rule four, as well as oxygen's typical oxidation state of negative two. Rule four says that the sum of oxidation numbers for all atoms in a molecule or polyatomic ion equals the charge of the molecule or ion. And this makes sense. It's just like formal charge, right? The total charge on all of the atoms needs to add up to the net charge of the molecule or ion. 